time in. So please excuse me for spending so little time, but I want to try and look at some of the big picture uh, issues. And so what I'm going to do in the talk is I'm first going to spend the first 15 minutes or so talking about some of the problems that we are going to see or we're going to have to face over the order of the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I then want to look at about three categories of issues that we have to, to deal with. And I'm going to spend most time on the first one. And that is the issue of how we can balance the supply and the demand in the food system without there being really major problems, large increases in food prices, the danger of hunger, etc. And I'll be arguing that everything we do in the food system needs to be done considering environmental sustainability and considering the needs of the very poorest, the one billion people, give or take, who go to bed each night hungry. And I'll say a little bit about them at the end, but I won't have time to give, them, to give those two topics the, uh, the length of time they obviously uh, deserve. So let's look at what might be some of the growing pressures on the food system. And of course, as we all know, one of the main pressures that we're going to see going through is increasing populations. And th this is United Nations projections coming out of the group in uh, IASA in Vienna. And it's probably about right. Actually, since I drew this graph, it, it's sort of edging up a little bit. But almost certainly, we're going to have to feed somewhere of the order of 9 or 10 billion people by the middle of the century. I, I say almost certainly, but there is considerable variation about that. It might be better. It could, if things go wrong, could be considerably w worse. But not only are we going to have to feed more people, but these people are largely going to be richer, which is a good thing. And if you're richer, you'll be demanding a more varied diet. And a diet that contains many food types, as we've heard already, that have a greater impact on the environment. And just to pick one food type out, I've plotted there uh, livestock consumption. This is data from the Food and, Ag food and Agricultural Organization of the, uh, um, of the UN. And this is meat consumption, livestock consumption among the developed nations. And let me just pause by saying that there is a great range of different meat types. And so I'm being a bit simplistic just looking at one type of meat. But there we are in the developed nations. In fact, in Europe, meat consumption is going down very slightly. In America, it's um, constant. It's not going up. I don't think Americans can physically eat more meat than they do, <laughs> than they do at the moment. But look at China. China is going up really, really radically. Probably the single thing that is increasing demand at the moment. And China is one of the BRIC countries, the countries that are rapidly industrializing, becoming richer, and approaching a Western diet. But that's India. And India, it's not on quite the same trajectory as China. It's probably a little bit behind. But it, it's not something that's ineluctable about increased wealth leads to a Western diet. For interesting economic, social, cultural regions, diets are not changing in India as they have in China. And there, I don't know if you can see it at that, but it's Africa along the bottom. And Africa, large parts of it are still very poor. Meat consumption is still very low. So we're clearly going to see dramatically increasing demand going into the future. And we're going to see it at the time that there are threats to supply. And I'm not going to spend a long time going through the litany of problems that we're likely to face, because I suspect all, all of you know it. But we'll see as the population gets bigger, Increased competition for land, increased competition for water, which we've already heard about, for energy and for other inputs, perhaps some limiting fertilizers. And all of these challenges we'll have to see at the time when we experience an existential threat to the human race through climate change. And I put mean and variance there to remind me to say that although the major effects of climate change the effects that are unavoidable now, because there is so much carbon dioxide, although they're probably going to be coming in in the second half of the century, we are going to see increasing evidence of climate change, probably first in the, in the increased uh, frequency of, um, of um, extreme events. And you in Portugal are having a very um, dry winter, as we are at least in parts of the UK. And there is some suggestion that the reason for this 
is that the jet stream has gone north because the ice in the Arctic Ocean is melting. Now, we don't know that for certain yet, but I suspect as the years go by, there will be more and more instances of where climate change is having negative effects. I, I would just, th this is some work we commissioned as part of the report that shows how these are agricultural areas, areas that produce grain, and you can see that they're getting warmer for, for different scenarios. We still don't know really uh, what's going to happen. And just for those of you who are interested, there's an interesting project that was launched last week coming out of Potsdam, which is going to take all these models and try and compare them to see what we can say about what's going to happen. So we're going to see increasing demand, and we're going to see threats to supply at the same time. And we still live in a world where nearly a billion people go to bed hungry each night. Most of them in Africa, Asia, in the Pacific. If you look at the numbers of hunger, this is 1970 to 2015, it's remained roughly constant in absolute numbers with a recent blip. If you look at it in terms of percentage, because the population was going, is going up, the percentage of the world's people hungry was going down. And in fact, we were, until a few years ago, on track to meet the Millennium Development Goals which was essentially to have 8% hungry, hungry by 2015. And I'll say a bit, about, bit more about this in a second, but it's largely because of the recent volatility in food prices that we are not, uh, almost certainly not going to make it. Now, I suspect no one here believes that the reason why we have hungry people is, not because, we, is because we don't pr produce enough food. It is a myth that the problem with hunger is that the world can't produce enough food. The problem with people going hungry is that sometimes they don't have physical access to food. If you live in Somalia or in a failed state, you often just don't have physical access to food. But overwhelmingly, that you're too poor to afford food or to afford the means of growing it yourself. And sometimes you have so problems with social access to food. So hunger is intimately involved with issues of development. And I said about a billion people go to bed each night calorie hungry, but then another billion people, the people are sometimes called a hidden hunger, uh, go to bed because of, uh, um, have insufficient nutrients of one type or another, suffer some form of malnutrition. And I understand later on in this series you will have some discussions particularly of this problem. And another problem I'm not going to talk about now, and at this stage I suck my belly in, is that about a billion people are overweight, and a third of them are clinically obese. And we're having situations where countries which have done very well in reducing the diseases of malnutrition, hunger, and micronutrient deficiencies, are now beginning to suffer the diseases of the rich world, the coronary diseases, the diabetes. So these are really important questions. I'm largely not going to be talking much more about it, but not because they aren't important. And finally, the food system is not sustainable. And you hear the word sustainable rather bandied around these days. It's not sustainable, and sometimes it's used almost for effect. The food system at the moment is literally not sustainable in the sense that the food we produce at the moment we would not be able to produce in 20 or 30 years' time if we try to do it in the same way. And to give a very concrete example of that, one of the successes of addressing hunger in India has been that there are a lot of areas in the northwest of the country, in the Punjab and Rajasthan, which have become really efficient bread baskets, growing lots of wheat. But they rely almost exclusively on aquifers, on water that is pumped up from the ground. And they're having to drill ever lower to get, out of the water, to get that water out. And that water will disappear in 15 years. And we're going to see a large, very productive agricultural region ceasing to be productive. And there are places all around the world where the same problems, including in the rich world, large parts of Central North America, United States. So water is probably the first thing that, and I know it's something that uh, is discussed a lot in Portugal at the moment, 
But in addition, there are real issues with soil. 24% of vegetated land suffers some form of soil degradation. Agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gases. 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, when looked at on the same scale, come from agriculture. About 15%, half of that, comes directly from agriculture, the way we keep cows, the way we produce rice, the way we deal with manure. But another 15% comes indirectly from the way we convert, we cut down forests to make new agricultural land. And again, as, as I think one of the people introducing the talk said, really is critical to think about these indirect effects. Agriculture's major sources of nitrates and other pollutants. Large areas of the Caribbean Sea are just completely dead because of the nitrogen that flows down the Mississippi and out there. And finally, and this is not something I'm going to be saying very much just because I won't have time, nearly all the capture fisheries that we, uh, exploit, uh, that, that we use are overexploited. It's something I know that Portugal is extremely concerned about. Issues of fisheries management are incredibly important. And so we have all these threats, and what we may be seeing is the beginnings of these actually working through to affecting the food system at the moment. And this is the FAO Food Price Index, which began in 1990 and um, is, uh, remained for the first uh, 20 years or so relatively low. And then we had a major food spike in 2008, another one in 2010. That data is about a month, a month out of date but it is still very high. Now, at least in the rich world, food, food is still historically cheaper. We in Europe spend, I think, on average about 14% of our income on food. In the States, it's under 10%. No civilization has ever spent that little on food since money was invented. So we must remember that food is historically cheap at the moment but yet we've had these recent periods of volatility. And so you can make an argue for us in the West, argument that for us in the West, perhaps it wouldn't matter if food prices actually went up a bit. And there is some truth in that, but we do live now in a globalized world. And what happens to global food prices has effects throughout the world, including poorer countries. I think it'd be foolish for anyone to say that the reason why we've seen the Arab Spring over the last... Uh, couple of years, over the last year and a half, has been because of food prices. But I think food prices were clearly something that, um, that was one of the several causes of the convulsions in North Africa and now in, in, in the Middle East. And we are living in a very different world. If you went back even 20 years ago, so many people in the poorest parts of the world lived in rural communities. And if you live in rural communities and you suffer starvation, then you do have some means of buffering yourself by going out and foraging for what I call famine foods, a type of food you wouldn't normally eat unless you really, really were hungry. And if you failed to do that, and if you really sadly died, you died invisibly, no one saw you. Now increasingly, over 50% of the world's population lives in cities. And when you get hungry in a city, there's very little you can do to buffer yourself. You can't dig up roots or things like that. And when that fails, you, the, it's immediately seen in political action and going out into the streets. So I'd be very interested to hear what Mr. Kuhner thinks very much about trade things. But we are in a curious position now where food is probably too cheap, and yet the consequences of food prices going up are going to be political and economic instability. What have I done? Oh, there we go. So that's a brief canter through some of the threats and challenges facing the food system. And I want to, what I want to do now is to explore some of the issues about balancing future de demand and supply sustainably. And of course, the first thing you might want to ask is, I've talked about that demand side pressures, population and consumption growth, competition for water and energy. I've talked about all these things, but you could say, well, do we actually know that this is a problem? Do we actually know that this is going to lead to shortages to increased food prices? Now, within the Foresight Project, 
we did some modeling with a group at the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, led by Jerry Nelson, who are probably some of the best people modeling in this area. It was very interesting for me. My background is a, as a biologist, and I spent my working life feeling very inferior to physicists who can sort of do models that actually work and don't have to make lots of assumptions. It was wonderful working with economists. They have to make even more heroic assumptions than we do in biology. But you have to do it. It's really important. And so this is one example of the models that were produced. For those of you who are economists, it's partial equilibrium economic models, a partial equilibrium economic model. It's interesting in that it's coupled to climate change model. Uh, it's also got a representative of global hydrology in. But putting aside those, those differences, I'm going to show you one result, and this is for different assumptions about how yield growth in one particular crop, maize, might change over the next 20 to 30 years. And this is what percentage price increases might be by 2050. Um, and in fact, the different scenarios don't make that much difference. But we're seeing business as usual, and with no climate change, price rises of the order of 40 45% which will be serious, although people will be richer, so there is some counterbalance to that. But if you put in climate change, and climate change is going to have significant effects on yields, then uh, we're seeing price rises of the order of 100%. Now, having given you this results, I, I would strongly encourage you not to believe them. But yet the number of other models who are sort of doing, working in this area all point towards problems of this order. And even if you don't believe the, the details of the individual economics, I think there is a really strong argument that one uh, should be really quite worried just when you try and do any calculation of how supply and demand uh, uh, come into action. Now, a number of groups who've done models such as this, including the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, have come up with the argument that we need to produce a certain amount of more food. The Food and Agriculture of the Organization, uh, food and, FAO, said the world needs to produce 70% more food. A couple of other groups have said 100%. And we in the uh, UK government report did not want to put a figure on it like that. Because our argument is that action is needed throughout the food system Yes, we do have to produce more food. Increasing supply is important. But it is not just an agricultural problem. And I think the president of the foundation put this, put this very well. Not only do we need to think about supply, but we need to think about demand. We need to think what we, what we eat and maybe change that. We need to think about waste and we need to have horrible discussions about how we improve the governance and efficiency of the food system. We need to get involved in the cap and things. And I think anyone who gets into cap negotiations is a hero, so more power to your argument. Cap is so important for us in Europe, it is not a sexy thing to study, but it is incredibly important. And as I said, the argument that we make is that anything we do how we produce more food, what food types we should try and eat or not eat, how we reform CAP, how we reform Doha Round or whatever will replace the Doha Round when it dies. Everything must be tested against these twin prisms. What does it do for environmental sustainability? Climate change, yes, but other things as well. And how does it address the needs of the poorest? So what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes is say, a little bit about supply, demand, efficiency, and governance. Of course, if we were having this discussion 50 years ago, 100 years ago, then something that you could really think of as a strategy would be to bring substantial new land into agriculture. Now, there isn't that much land out there, but if you actually look at the consequences of bringing that land into agriculture, especially cutting down rainforests, especially draining wetlands, the consequences for greenhouse gas emissions, for putting carbon dioxide into the air, are just terrible. The best way to get carbon dioxide up there is to cut down tropical rainforests. And it has horrible effects on biodiversity. Biodiversity much harder to value 
But the argue for, argument for greenhouse gas emissions seems to be absolutely critical. So a very important point, I believe, that we and other people have said is that bringing more land into agriculture is not part of the solution of feeding the world. That's not to say that restoration of agricultural land, restoration of the 24% or whatever of agricultural land, which is now severely degraded, isn't a really critical bit. So if you accept the argument that increasing yields must be a part of the solution and that there is no new land, then you have to produce more food from the same amount of land with less environmental impact. And you have to increase the efficiency with which you use water, nitrogen, and things. And you have to have less negative environmental effects, such as greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And what we, we call this, and others have called it, sustainable intensification. And some people hate this term. They feel that intensification means farming in a particular way, sort of big business agriculture. And that's not what we mean at all by sustainable intensification. I'll say a bit more about it later on. It's using any means you can to produce more food in an environmentally friendly way, using the best of organic farming, the best of high-tech modern farming. Okay, so sticking with supply... You can produce more using existing knowledge. You can close the yield gap. Here we have wheat yields in France, USA, Argentina, and Kazakhstan. And you can guess what the maximum yield is, given the local climate and given the local soil conditions. And that's what could be grown in this area. So if you get the incentives right, if you get the conditions right, the economic, the skills, you can produce more food. Notice that France, the yields are really up there. It may be that France, the yields at the moment in France are economically unrealistic because of the common agricultural policy there. The USA is rather curious because wheat doesn't tend to be grown as a crop of first choice. But certainly in Argentina, especially in the old states of the Soviet Union, there's a lot that can be done. Now, if the arguments I've given you are right, that demand will go up, then this will lead to price signals. This will lead to food going up. And so we will see some of the yield gap closing in response to demand. That's how market economies should work. And certainly the argument that we've made is that what the strategy should be, what the policy should be in Europe, in UK, in Portugal, should not be to go, to go back to an old-fashioned target for growth, a uh, target for yield growth, but to look at the barriers for our farmers to respond to price signals. What, where is there a deficit in the skills that people have to produce things, to produce more food? We perhaps need to rethink our model of extension the advice we give to food producers, not to go back to the old form of its extension we had 20 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago, but to think about a modern form of revitalized extension using part public money where we're asking food producers to do public goods such as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but then part private money where we're actually helping food producers make more money. And I think that applies equally in developing countries as in developed countries, although with different challenges of exactly how you fund it. And certainly in developing countries, then there are issues of getting in the economic and physical structure, linking areas of food production to markets, investing in the roads and the ports, doing what Brazil has done so extraordinarily well over the last 20 years. Now, there are some people, especially people who do not like the idea of modern scientific agriculture, who will say that's all we need to do. Again, can make some heroic assumptions about the speed with which we are likely to, to, to uh, um, bring down the yield gap. But I think that's a very dangerous assumption, just if you look at the challenges ahead. We have to invest in new knowledge, not only to do absolute things, like to increase yields, 
but also to maintain the yields we have at the moment. Agriculture is not like other industries in that farmers have to forever fight with pests, with diseases, with pathogens, with weeds, with things that are evolving the whole time. Agricultural research cannot uh, stand still. It must forever be fighting back about these biotic challenges. And I think a worrying thing has been that over the last 40 years, when food has been so cheap, there has been very little impetus for governments to invest in agricultural research. I'm at Oxford. 30 years ago, Oxford had departments of agriculture, agricultural ecology, soil science, and forestry. All have gone. It was impossible for a major research university to find enough research funding to keep that going. I think in this regard, Portugal has been better than we have been in the UK. So I think there's a great need for more research, but it needs to be refocused research. It's not just yields, but it's... In the old days, what a crop breeder would do or what a livestock breeder would do would be try and breed a fatter cow or a wheat with more, he with more grains on its head. Nowadays, it's more complicated. Yes, we need more yields, but yes, we need breeds that are more sustainable, more efficient, that uses water well. My colleagues at Oxford are breeding for redesigned root systems that are just much more efficient at taking up water. And we also need to refocus some of our research, not on the maize and the rice and the barley and the wheat, but on the sorghum and the cassava and the millet, the crops that the poorest people in the driest parts of Africa need. And I think there's a really exciting recent work, particularly funded by the Gates Foundation, that is going into that. So what type of agricultural research should we invest in? Now, my view is that if you look dispassionately at the threats the world is likely to feel to experience on the food system in the next 40 years, it is just foolish to throw away any particular strategy. So I think that one should invest in biotech, including GM, but, not, but treating GM as just one of a number of techniques that will be valuable in some cases and will in very many cases not be to be value. I think it is wrong to exclude it, but I think it's equally wrong to oversell what GM is going to do. It's not going to feed Africa, but it might help in certain cases. So I think we do need to invest in the high-tech scientific parts, uh, highly scientific parts of agronomic res research. But I think we equally need to invest in some of the neglected subjects. And I suspect slightly less neglected in Portugal than in the UK and America. Agronomy, agroecology, soils. There are only about four working soil scientists left in, in the whole of the UK. And I think there's some barriers to actually doing this research and getting it out. I think we need to understand much more the social and economic context of innovation. And here it's a problem of my community. So the research community, we tend to go and do our research and then sort of say, hey, you farmers, take, take this and go and run with it. Really important to work right from the beginning, especially in less developed countries. And I think, and I won't go into this because it, it, it's complex, it takes too long, but we need to get right the different funders of the generation of new knowledge. It's complex. What is the right role for the public sector? What is the right role for, for the private sector? Something I guess you've had to grapple with over your career in politics. And increasingly, the third sector, groups such as the Bill and Melinda Gates, but other groups as well, are becoming highly influential. OK, so that's issues on supply. Let me say a little bit about demand. As um, the president of the foundation said, it is impossible, literally impossible, for the world to have a Western diet. And in particular, the cu current meat production. We could not produce uh, enough meat. There are some straightforward research questions here, two of which I've highlighted. First of all, we do not yet know enough, and this is something I know Jose thinks about a lot, we do not know enough about the footprint of different food types. So as I said, I, I've been rather unfair just talking about meat and the, the 
environmental harms of meat. Certain ways of producing meat, especially chicken and pigs, are extremely efficient. Ways of producing beef fed on grain that could have been uh, turned into bread are highly non-efficient. We heard statistics about milk. On the other hand, two months ago I was in Kenya with the Samburu people in the north. They only eat meat and milk products. They can't grow anything there. So it's, you have to be very careful about demonizing one type of food. But we need to understand better that. And we also need to understand better what makes people eat different types of food. And here the best research, and I know you're going to hear more about it later in this lecture series, is actually on how people respond to, um, to food that has different health consequences. But I think there is a real issue is how do we empower consumers, empower us, to be able to make more informed decisions. I think better labeling is part of it, but not everything. I think better education, better information is part of it as well. But I am not someone who believes that consumer behavior alone is going to change the, the, give rise to the changes in the type of food we eat that is required over the next 30 or 40 years. And I think one of the most important things that an informed debate, conversations like we're having this evening can do, is to bring the discourse in civil society to a sufficient level that politicians are sort of legitimized to act, to take decisions at the moment that are too hard for them to do, to legislate, to tax certain amounts of food, maybe even for the private sector to restrict what they put in their supermarket shelves. This terrible term, choice editing, which means just putting one thing out and not the other. And I think one can draw a parallel with smoking. So we have known, as a matter of fact, that smoking kills us for 50, possibly 60 years. There's been really no doubt about that in the scientific world. And yet it's taken 30 or 40 years for the public discourse, the civil society discourse on smoking to have got to a certain extent that, that, you could, uh, that governments have been able to act. Probably the most extraordinary thing that has happened in my adult life, something I would never have predicted when I was 20, is that you cannot smoke in a restaurant in Paris. I would never have believed it. And I think we need to have as sophisticated and as difficult a discussion about some of the issues around what we eat influencing demand as there has been in, um, in smoking. I'm going to speed up slightly because I do want to finish on time. We waste a lot of food. About 30% of all food that is produced is never consumed. A lot of it in low-income countries is on the farm and in the transport system. In high-income countries, we waste it in the home. We often waste it in restaurants. We waste it in the food sector. There are things that can be done to address all of this. I, I think we have to, again, be a bit sophisticated on this. Some people say, well, there isn't a food problem. We just stop wasting 30%. But you need to take a hard economic look at it. The hard economics will tell you some good news. One of the reasons we waste so food at the moment is food is so cheap. As food gets a bit more expensive, then we will stop wasting it. During the Second World War, 2% of food was wasted uh, in, in Europe. But I think to get back to that level in response to price, maybe prices will never get that high, and it does need that people have the food literacy, the skills to know what to do. I suspect our mothers and grandmothers would be appalled at how little we know about food compared to their generations. And there are issues that some waste actually makes sense economically and even environmentally. So I think it's foolish to think that there's just an easy big win out there, but nevertheless, it's, there are clear gains from being more efficient in food. And then we have this really important about improving governance. And I'm going to say very little a bit about this because Mr. Kuna will be talking about it in a moment. But trade is so important for food, we inevitably leave, live in a globalized world. We're not going to turn back globalization. 
I think the real challenge, as Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize-winning economist, put in his wonderful book, Globalism and Its Discontents, how do we get globalization working in favor of different societal goods? How do we get it working in favor of food security? And a well-functioning global food system allows different countries protection against production shocks. What we know from climate change is that we're going to get more extreme events and he's going to have bigger geographical areas. We're going to see more times the wheat crop in the whole of Australia being knocked out. Major disruptions to maize in North America. We need a functioning food system that allows different, grain, uh, different areas to compensate for each other and allows the exploitation of comparative advantage the wonderful opportunities for producing grain in the old Soviet Union countries in Brazil. But this is complicated, and there are difficult discussions about globalization and self-sufficiency, and difficult um, issues about liberalized trade rules. And I don't want to talk anything more about it. In Mr. Kuna's presence, he's spent a long time thinking about issues of subsidies, international equity. How do we get trust in times of crisis? Now, I think there's been some rather good news recently if you compare the 2008 and 2010 food price spikes. Special measures for the poorest. How do you introduce... And the biggest... Pascal Lamy, the head of the WTO, was, gave a lecture last night in Oxford, which I went to. He has no idea how to introduce sustainability issues into WTO negotiations, but realize it's Im important. And we have to think about, pr about price volatility, Volatility is a bad thing. It causes market inefficiencies. It penalizes the poor. It's likely to increase in the future. A lot of people have thought that the movement of investment capital from American mortgages, for example, into commodities might be one of the reasons we've seen a lot of speculation recently. Now, we spent a lot of time looking into that and reviewing the literature on it. I don't think that's the reason, even though some people would like to say it is. But when one looks what might be done to address volatility in the future, then it's critical to monitor modern commodity trade, trading, critical to increase market transparencies. A lot can be done within the financial system. People have called for, global, for, for a, a global system of grain reserves. We worry very much about that. It's too much of a target out for, for speculators. But volatility, there will always be some volatility, and we need some innovative ways of thinking how we can provide appropriate insurance for producers, both individual producers, especially in poor countries, but also sovereign insurance for poor, for poor countries. And I think if a millionth of the ingenuity that the banks had put into developing ever more baroque credit default swaps and things like that, if a tiny fraction of that ingenuity had gone into producing financial tools that would actually help poor countries cope with, uh, with volatility, we'd be in a much better place than we were. And there will always be the need to target food reserves for the vulnerable. Okay, you will remember I said I was going to talk about four things, and I've only done two. And I will reassure you that I have five minutes left, and I will finish on time. And I'm only going to speak very briefly about these last two, and not because they aren't important. And the first is the issue of ending hunger. I think one of the problems with agriculture, food, and the poor over the last 30 years is that there has been an ideological stance that um, investing in low-income country agriculture is not a good way of helping countries. And I think this is changing. I think there's a growing recognition of the triple benefits of agriculture. It produces food, it gets money into rural incomes, into rural communities. It often gets money into the pockets of women who produce 70% of the, of the uh, food in, in Africa. It's a good way of getting money to the more disadvantaged people. There have been decades of, un of underinvestment. We must rebuild infrastructure, we must reposition. I've spoken to Senior civil servants in African countries who say there is no prestige in working in agriculture departments. You want to work in finance or the foreign office or health, and then agriculture is right at the bottom. That must change. Smallholding farmers. Smallholding farmers is absolutely critical to support their production for food. 
Yet I think there's a real danger of romanticizing smallholder farming to the exclusion of all others. Smallholders must be a critical component of the, of the solution. But there is probably also a place for larger scale farming, at least in some areas. And we must do better at scaling up best practice. Africa's full of model villages where things work well. We're bad at scaling up. We're bad at monitoring and the environment. And then finally, two slides on sustainable, foods, on sustainable food systems. One on climate change. We need to be better able to assess the vulnerability of different communities and have different <coughs> metrics about what might happen as climate change affects agriculture. And the Potsdam project I mentioned right at the beginning, I think, is a good stance. We have to, that we know we're going to get at least two degrees increase in temperature. No one I know among the physics community, among, among the climate communities, thinks it's going to be under four degrees. That's pretty frightening. We need a lot of adaptation using both existing knowledge and new knowledge. It's the same issues as increasing supply. We have to look for the potential for agriculture to help mitigate climate change. We need increased efficiency so that agriculture produces less of the greenhouse gases, especially the methane and nitrous oxide. We need better management. Again, a lot of greenhouse gases can be, can be reduced just by the way you keep your cows, just by the way you treat your, fertile, your manure, just by the way you grow your rice. There is a lot that can be done with carbon sequestration, increasing carbon in soils, agroforestry. We can use waste more efficiently. And then what we must have to do is we must need a sensible biofuels policy. I'm going to say no more about biofuels because otherwise you'll need men in white coats to drag me off as I sort of get so angry. The way we're implementing biofuels in the States, in Europe, is plain crazy. It's getting better, but it's still pretty crazy. And finally, let me just say a word about biodiversity. My background is in biology. I'm a biodiversity nut. We need a multifunctional landscape. Well, landscape that, yes, produces food, but produces, supports biodiversity, and does much else. I think there are really hard issues of scale. So we need a multifunctional landscape. But should it be that everywhere produces biodiversity and food as best they can, or should some areas really concentrate on food and other areas? For example, the wonderful cork, cork oak pig systems you get in the east of this country and extra Madura, should they concentrate on bio biodiversity? There are really hard questions there, which I don't think my community, the environmental community, or the agricultural community have really got to grips with yet. It's hard. Do we share values when it comes to biodiversity? Many people don't care about biodiversity. How can we get a consensus? There are issues of governance. There are issues of the rights and the vulnerabilities of the poor. And as I said, a need for a more sophisticated discourse. So finally, I think, and I think the speakers who introduced me said very much the same thing. This really is a unique time in history. We, oh, excuse me, that's to tell me, it's to tell me to shut up, but I'm going to go on for 30 seconds if that's okay. <laughs> you can see I'm a biodiversity person. That was a duck that was cracking at me there. So, and I'm a population biologist. I'm more optimistic now, age 53, than when I was 25. 25 years ago, 28 years ago, you could not make an intellectual argument that global populations would peak naturally. We now know that the demographic, tradition, the demographic transition will happen, that if we do things right, there will be an end to global population growth. We can, for the first time, really consider that Malthus was wrong, that we aren't going to have a hard landing. Humankind now dominates the global system. Water, carbon, nitrogen, anything you think about it, there isn't a natural system. It's a human-dominated global system. But it's also a unique time. Post the Cold War, uh, the um, Cold War ending, the Iron Curtain coming down, there is very much a global consensus on ending poverty. So the key message we tried to put across in the report is that the food system is going through radical change, a phase change. We're moving from an area, from a time, 
where at least in the rich world, the problem was producing too much, to a time where demand is coming up. The food system and food thinking needs radical and profound change along some of the lines I've talked about this evening, but along many other lines that I've not had to do. Then my final message is, if we fail on food, we fail on everything. What are you most interested in? The poorest in developing countries fail on food, we can't help them. Are you interested in biodiversity? We fail on food, forget biodiversity. Are you interested in climate change? We are not going to get any attention on climate change and reducing greenhouse gases if we fail on food. Food is absolutely critical to what will happen over the next 40 years. Thank you for your attention.